Uh, so for those of you that don't know, uh, my name is John Timmerman. I have two businesses. Um, CC actually works with me at my marketing agency. We are a strategic marketing agency, um, mostly focused in digital, but we help companies come up with strategies to grow in this digital world. So that could be social media, that could be websites, that could be video production, that could be, hey, uh, that could be email marketing, um, it could be outbound sales, which is actually helping their sales team use the internet, so like LinkedIn and social media to, to develop business opportunities. My other business is we make jeans. So Jackson Jovi, we make athletic fit denim. So uh, we can get into this with Q&A, but we started when I started training in CrossFit and my body changed, I got, thighs got a little bigger, my, my ass got a little bit bigger and, <laughs> and just had different proportions and then realized like I had friends that played hockey in college and now they, you know, they don't really work out anymore, but they just have that proportion. And so I found a, a niche that was, wasn't really served. Like sure, plenty of companies make stretchy jeans, but there's not too many that actually make them fit proportion wise for somebody who was gifted with a thick thighs and, and a big ass or trained to get there, right? So we figured that out, made them a sample Found there's a huge market for it, and here we are today with a, a pretty niche uh, business that's that's doing pretty well internationally. So um, I got some questions that Olivia sent over, but this is super informal. Like any questions you have about my businesses or um, your potential businesses or how that fits together, just let it rip, and, and we'll go from there. But I'll start out by, by answering any of these questions, a couple of these questions first. Um, so you guys are all in college, right? You're all in school. You want to know what you're going to do next. Is it going to work? Is it going to work out? What am I going to do? So uh, my background is actually in kinesiology. It has nothing to do with what I'm doing now other than I worked out, and that's kind of what led to me starting a gene company. But like kinesiology, exercise science, for about eight years, I was a personal trainer, strength and conditioning coach, sports performance coach for uh, hockey, baseball, football, soccer players from like 11 years old all the way up to NFL, M MLB, and NHL players, uh, depending on the season and, and location. Um, I went to Boston, trained there, went to Richmond, Virginia, lived there for three years, at a, worked at a training facility. And then that led to my first company, which was a personal training company. It started real kind of organically. I had a guy come in. He was loaded. He owned a, some like oil company. They made like the coatings that go on oil rigs. He comes in. He's like, I golf. I want to get better at golf. What do I have to do? And I was like, uh, I don't know anything about golf, but I can make you stronger. I can make you swing a little bit harder. I can loosen up your flexibility. He's like, great. I want to pay you $1,000 a month and you just need to train me basically whenever I want. Because he's flying all over the world, you know, he's flying to like Dubai and Japan, and he flies in at 6 a.m. in the morning and wants to get an hour training, like, I'll let you know a couple hours ahead, but you gotta sort of be on call. I'm young, I'm like you guys, I'm like, yeah, thousand bucks a month, let's do it. That was my first business. Started my own personal training company that way. Grew that a little bit. Um, had a few other clients, and then, you know, this is start. Date, this is like the first time I'm actually dating myself here. But uh, this was right when like Facebook was becoming a business thing. Like it had been around. Like it came out when I was in college, only for colleges. Like it was only you could only get Facebook if you were like at a school. And then it, it went to the public, and it became like this thing where businesses were like, "Hey, we can use this to market ourselves." So I started using Facebook and email marketing and SEO, and I made an online personal training company. Uh, I like to say it was like the first one in the world, but who knows? Now they're everywhere. Now every Instagrammer is a, has an online personal training company. So we called that the newfit.net. Built a whole online thing so you could join if you wanted to become stronger and faster in soccer, and you could join if you wanted to just get ripped abs, and you could, you know, so you could go on and have video training, you could get your programs, right? 
So that's how I went from my college degree to starting this entrepreneurship track, right? Uh, entrepreneurship at the time wasn't where it is now, where you guys are all here to learn how do I start my own business. It wasn't really like that. It was sort of like, like yeah, entrepreneurs were cool, but it wasn't like we, you could see them everywhere on Instagram being like, yeah, I can start my own business and build my own destiny. It wasn't really there, right? So I kind of like fell into it and learned how to do it built the website, started to get clients from around the world, figured out how to use Facebook to put that out there and, and get new customers and people. So uh, sort of digressing here, but the, the question is like sort of, you know, what do you see as valuable uh, with a college degree and how do you apply that? So like I would have never, I, I can't really say like today where I'm where I am because of what I learned in college. But I also probably wouldn't be here if I didn't ha start my college career and go for kinesiology and learn exercise science and get so passionate about training people and then get into my career and get into my career and have this opportunity open up where this random dude asked me to train him every month. Like that doesn't happen to every trainer. Half the trainers I know wish that happened to them, right? Like it just happened to, to do it. So college opened up that opportunity for me to go down that route but then it's on these opportunities that I don't know what your business is but like you might be wanting to do this and then tomorrow you might meet some dude who loves your personality and wants to give you twenty thousand dollars to start it I mean you just never know when that's gonna happen so it's it's really just kind of keeping that dream alive with the entrepreneurship side and using what you're learning in college and what you're doing and the jobs that you get as your support system for that. And if they're aligned, mazel tov. Like that's even better, right? Like if you love what you're going to school for and that's what you wanna start your own business in, that's fantastic because you can go get your first job uh, doing exactly what you wanna do under the best person in the world that does that thing, learn from them, and then spin off and start your, your own thing. You know, so like, the application of college to entrepreneurship, uh, in, in my opinion, is it's going to provide the foundation that will get you to where you want to be a lot quicker than if you just started from scratch, right? Like if I, by the way, started the jeans company from scratch, started Good Monster from scratch without a background. If I did have a background, we'd be a you know, $100 million company by now just because I would have never made the mistakes because I learned it from, from somebody else. So lesson learned, but we're doing okay. Um, so what most important skill did you wish you had learned in college? Uh, for me personally, like probably like business finance, honestly. Like if you're looking to go to into your own business, whether it's a coffee shop or a a software company or a construction company or a supply chain logistics company like finance is really the thing that you either need to bring somebody in who understands it or you need to understand it um, I mean you could say that about anything I just have a marketing mindset and a marketing brain so I didn't really need that but I definitely had to learn <coughs> finance and how that whole system works and that was something that didn't really come natural to me. So I did that as long as I could until I could afford to hire somebody else to do that. Uh, but that's just me personally. I wish I took some, some finance classes in college. I don't think I, I took any. Um, uh, biggest risks that I've taken as an entrepreneur and how did they pay off? I'd say the biggest risk is starting two businesses when you have no idea what you're doing. Um, again, for me, like that's just my personality. Uh, everyone has their own personality, risk adver adversity, and, and um, ability to take on risk, right? Like if you're struggling to pay for student loans right now and you're trying to pay off your debt before, before you get out or you're taking on a lot of debt, like chances are you're not going to have a bunch of money to dump into a business when you get out of college, right? So. If you do have a bunch of money, like that's going to make it a lot easier. It's a lot riskier, a lot less riskier, if you already have it and you can spend it on, on you know, trying this thing out. So like the risk adversity is different for everybody, but for me, 
the biggest risk was going away from what I spent four years learning, the career that I had, the business that I had built up, uh, the online personal training company and the personal training business, and seeing that the internet was taking this huge direction and that marketing was a huge opportunity uh, and going in that direction and just learning it, just figuring the shit out. Like, that was a huge risk. Uh, and I'll do something that should humble everybody in here, it humbles me, is that when I first started Good Monster, uh, wasn't even called Good Monster at that time. Like, I actually moved back in with my parents in order to start it, like, so that I didn't have to pay myself hardly anything in order to hire other people to do what I couldn't do. But ultimately, that's what got me to the place that I, that I am now. Like, without doing that, I wouldn't have been able to afford life, and I would have been like, shit, okay, I got to go get another job. Right? So that was a huge risk. Luckily, I had the support system to, to fall back on. Um, this is a good one. How, do you, how did I gain credibility for my companies? Um, testimonials and case studies. No matter what your business is, without those things, if you don't know somebody, there's going to be a huge barrier uh, f that is in between you and their trust. Like, especially, it, it gets harder and harder every day we go through the age that we're in, right? Think about the last thing you invested your time in, whether it was a Netflix video, a purchase on Amazon, uh, I don't know, coffee that you went when you first got here. Like, raise your hand if you look at reviews of something every single day, like Netflix, Amazon purchases, song ratings on Spotify. Uh, I don't know, I can go on and on and on. We just, we live off of ratings and reviews. It's called social proof. It's what drives Good Monster. That's literally what we do is our job is to take a company, build up their social proofs through influencer marketing, storytelling, you know, all the stuff that we do, build up the trust enough that somebody like you can go to them for the first time and be like, yep, I trust this company. I'm going to buy something or watch their movie or do whatever. So whatever business that I start or you start, the best thing you can do is to get a testimonial or 500. Um, I mean, if you go onto Jackson Jovi's website right now, our first full year in business was just last year. Our sole goal was to get as many people in the jeans as possible and have them leave a positive review. So for that reason, we spent probably thirty to forty thousand dollars on just event fees last year, going around the country. Nashville, Florida, Albany, New York City, uh did I say Miami already? Uh all these different places. So and and to get to these major events where there's a lot of fitness people, put the jeans on, and like one of our strategies was we'll give you a free t-shirt if you leave us a review, even if you don't buy the jeans. So we ordered hundreds of t-shirts, here's one of them, uh, and gave them away for free if they logged onto our website and left us a review. Those reviews now are the fuel that's getting us online orders every day. We know because we can see the click data. They look at the review, this person's like best jeans ever. Was very skeptical at first, but I can't believe how comfortable and well, how comfortable they are and how well they fit. Boom! They go over here. They select. They buy. So those testimonials um, for Good Monster, the case studies. We have a great case study that's for holiday time. We helped a somewhat local company here. They make gifts uh, like ornaments, basically. Um, for different holiday occasions like Easter and Christmas and uh, they hired us to help increase their e-commerce business right around November a couple of years ago for the Christmas season we helped them generate 1.1 million dollars using Facebook ads Google ads and that's pretty much it we helped their email their team out with some email marketing that case study has gotten us probably five clients since then that have gone on to generate tens of millions of dollars Without that one case study, who knows if we would have got it, right? So that's the single greatest thing with whatever business 
is if it's a long cutting job this summer, like I don't give a shit what it is. Like if you get one testimonial, you can then use that testimonial to knock on the next neighbor's door and say, Hey, can I cut your lawn this summer? Your neighbor, your neighbor hires me every Sunday. Look how good their lawn is. I mean, it's just what feels fuels business these days. Uh, what personality traits and skills do you think are necessary to have in order to succeed as an entrepreneur? So this one's, uh, this one's interesting. So I'm a believer that you can be born with the DNA like where you need to be an entrepreneur. I feel like that's me. I feel like at some point, whether it was Frank, the golfer, or it happened five years later, that I would have just had this need to become an entrepreneur. And I, it was kind of confirmed later on. I, was, I had a marketing director job at a law firm a little bit later on when I moved back from Richmond after my business. Uh, I took on this job. It was a really good opportunity. Worked there for like six months. And then I just literally was sitting at my desk one day. And I'm like, this is terrible. Like, this is not fun for me. I can't do... The 9 to 5 wasn't even the issue. It was just the lack of creativity. I was writing press releases all the time. So a friend of mine and I literally just went out and randomly started a YouTube show. In fact, you can write it down. They're still out there. It's called Project Rock City, R-O-C-K. And it was uh, a show sort of like Diners Drive... What's this show called? Diners Drive Drive Into Death. death. Yeah, so it was sort of like that. So go watch them. There's... I went to SUNY Cortland, so we did some places, some bars like the Dark Horse down in Cortland. We did some places here, um, some places in Rochester. And it was purely because I just had to like get it out of me. Like I had to create something. So like that was the entrepreneur in me coming out. That being said, you can totally learn to be an entrepreneur as well. It, it, you don't have to, but I do think that having that is gonna make it that much easier for you to be a successful entrepreneur. It's not gonna be as hard to take risks when this is what you were built to do. Just like it's a lot harder for me and you to play basketball than it is LeBron James, right? So it's the same with business. Like you can sort of be built for it or you can have to try a lot harder in order to get to that point. Personality traits that I think are uh, necessary are intestinal fortitude. You can take a a virtual punch to the gut on a daily basis and at least see some positives in it or get past it because every day I open up my email and there's some sort of fire doesn't matter if it's the gene company and somebody's belt loop ripped off Uh, if it's good monster a client campaign isn't doing as well as you know they thought we promised or that we did promise like those are daily punches to the gut an employee says they're not happy, they don't want to work any, for us anymore, or they got a better opportunity. They love working here, but there's a better opportunity, so now we have to go find somebody else. Like, every day, right? So that's huge, is being able to take that punch to the gut. And I think if you're in a business or you start a business that you're not super passionate about, it's harder to take those punches to the gut. Um, so that's one. And then... I think the other trait, the the only other kind of trait that I would say is that's important is being self-aware of what other personality traits you have and then finding somebody else, whether it's an employee or a co-founder, to fill in the other parts of that puzzle, I think is super important. Uh, If you have somebody exactly like you as a co-founder, you guys are going to butt heads sometime. So it's just going to be harder. It can be done, but it's harder. If you're type A and you find somebody else that's super creative, it's a lot easier to be like, okay, you go do this, you go do this. So I'd say the personality traits that, that would, you'd need to be successful like, are whatever traits you have, but you need to find somebody else that has the traits that you don't in order to be really successful. Um, Biggest struggles that I've faced when founding my companies? Um, finances. That's, that's the truth. Like, it's always the struggle. If you're in a service business, it's payroll. If you're in a product business or a, you, know, you have a supply, in, supply chain, it's affording your products. Do you have to take out a line of credit to get your products and then you have to sell those to pay off the line of credit? Like, 
It's just cash flow. It's always, no matter what business owner tells you, unless they're Mark Zuckerberg or somebody who just got a ton of funding and then took off. But honestly, even Facebook uh, <laughs> nowadays is, is having cash issues, right? Like it's always the case. So that's always the struggle, which is why I kind of said in hindsight, I wish I learned more about business finance in college because it would have helped me understand a little bit more early on what I was getting into. Um, okay, a couple more here. Do I ever think I will start a new business venture again? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I have a meeting to Thursday about another potential business. Again, I, like it's built into my DNA. Like I see opportunities and I want to, I, I need to scratch that itch. I need to see if there's something under there that's valuable. I need to see if there's something that, that could be woven into my current businesses or, I mean, I own a marketing agency. Like I could partner with just about any product, business, service company out there and build something profitable as long as they have the other aspect of it, right? So I'm always looking for opportunities and as long as it's not going to hurt my family or me physically, like I'll absolutely entertain it for sure. Um, okay, last one. What percentage of time do you find yourself managing others versus doing hands-on work? So this is something that I've actually personally benefited from and struggled with at the same time. I'm a super hands-on person, but I really don't like to micromanage. It's tough, right? Because one... I need to get in and, and learn something inside and out. I want to be able to understand it so that when I'm talking to our manufacturer for, for jeans, when I'm talking to a client for Good Monster, that I know what I'm talking about. I don't want to get into these meetings and, and not understand the system. I personally think that's really important for a leader of any company to understand what your employees, what your manufacturer, like what everybody is going through because then you can be empathetic to the things that can happen. Um, our video production company or one of the ones that we use for, for Good Monster just recently did a video that wasn't completely up to par. Wasn't exactly something that I wanted to bring to the client as is. It needed some revisions. But I automatically knew when they submitted the video what happened, why the issues came up, there were audio issues. I know why those audio issues happened because I'd been through it. I understand video production. I understand the pro, like the shit that can happen it is uncontrollable. But as we grow, you know, I was just talking to Cece about how we're hiring a lot of people now. We're growing, we're hiring, and I need to stay hands off. Even if they can only do it as 70% 70 70 as good as I can, I need to be okay with that. Otherwise, I get pulled back in as the leader and that means I can't lead. I can't, I can't do my job as the CEO as well as if I just let them do their job, make a mistake or two, and then learn from it and fix it. Now, if it gets out of control, obviously, I have to step in and be like, well, either A, this is bad, you're fired. <laughs> or like, hey, here's what happened. Let's, let's not do that again. Let's find a different way. Like those kinds of things, right? Like, so I, I need to be the leader. So I, I can't be hands-on all the time. And as the company grows, I'm going to be even less hands-on. As we get to 50 employees, like I'm not going to be nearly as hands-on when we had three. That's, a, that's any business, right? You, like, that's where a lot of small businesses get stuck, too. They were started by a, um, an operator. A lot of small businesses are started by somebody who's passionate about a thing, but doesn't have any passion to be a leader or get out of doing that thing. You know, you can see like a good example might be like a car mechanic, somebody who loves working on cars, starts their own business, business starts working on all their community's cars, but then is exposed to opportunities to franchise, to do this, to do that. And they're just like, I don't want to do that. I just want to work on cars. Right? So you either, that's when they sell their business to a bigger company and they just stay working on cars or they are, make the decision to now stop being a mechanic and, and be a business owner. They stop get, being hands-on and they start looking at the strategy, the finances, the bigger movements. <clears throat> you see this all the time 
for those of you that do follow entrepreneurship or like tech, you see this all the time in like tech startups, that the founder hires another CEO eventually, or the board does. Whoever's the decision maker gets to a point where they're like, you know what, you're not fit to be the CEO anymore. Uh, has anybody watched Silicon Valley, that HBO show? Didn't that happen in that show, right? Like Uber, it happened with Uber, that whole shit show that they went through, like the CEO had to step down. You see it all the time, right? Where a founder, that's why like Mark Zuck, if you guys buy stock, buy stock in Facebook and, and Amazon because you, the founders are the CEO, like they were built to be the CEOs. They're the unicorns out there. So their companies are virtually never gonna fail. Not often you see that. So those are the questions uh, that Olivia sent. Does anybody have any other questions about anything I just talked about? Yeah, what's up? What's your um, name? So Ben. Ben. Um, so when you're talking about it, when you get an email like a, it's a punch to the gut from say it's a client or it's a customer, um, what is generally like the response? Do you generally like just give them whatever they want, make them happy so they don't leave you a bad review or like tell another client? Or do you kind of like set a precedent and be like, no, like this is what we promised you. We are actually giving you what you paid. I would always go give them more than they're giving you. And so constantly keep that in, in your mind. Because if you're in a client services business, uh, you're being hired to, to give a service, obviously, right? And so your service is probably uh, given by a human being. Like it's not like you're selling this thing, right? So when you're selling a thing, it's a lot easier to, it's cut and dry. Like it worked or it didn't work. And that's sort of what you base your decision off of. In our business, there's a lot of subjectivity. Maybe they didn't like the video that we, that we made. Maybe they didn't like the copy. So I'll, I'll always go above and beyond. If they didn't like it, I'll fix it. If it gets to the point, and this is sort of where you just know in your gut, where they're taking advantage of the relationship, well then it comes down to a decision of like, is this a huge client that I don't care? I'll just keep getting Mike Tyson, then I don't even, I'll just go. Uh, or is it an unhealthy relationship? And we've had a, actually a couple of these where thankfully we mutually decided like it wasn't a good fit. But on those daily emails, uh, we, I balance the line or we balance the line between being a yes man and still making sure they understand like the reality of the situation. So just because they say, I didn't like this video, we'll come back with, well, did we test it yet? Who, do you not like the video? Or does your 10,000 customers we ran a Facebook ad to not like the video? Because if you don't like the video, I think you should kind of check that and let's, let's figure out if your customers like the video. If your customers don't like the video, okay, well, that's our fault. We'll change it. So, but it's always giving more than you're taking, and that means money too. And that's a problem for a lot of businesses um, is that they're so focused on the numbers that they don't give an inch to the actual person who's funding their business. You know, like, this gets crazier as the business gets bigger, right? Like, these giant companies that fake trying to feel like they're, like, a small business, you know, like, like Chase Bank, I don't know, like random companies like that that are massive, billions and billions and billions of dollars and they hire a marketing agency to make it seem like they're a local bank when they're not, like, you know, they're, they're you know, maybe at a local level they'll be w willing to wiggle a little bit, but like they have solid procedures and protocols that generally aren't broken. You get, you know, you get stuck into that, that position when you're a huge company uh, and I don't know because I'm not a billion dollar company but like I will always give way more and if for you guys if you start a business like you basically need to give if you're really going all in on this you need to give your life to make that business succeed which means I don't do a bunch of work for free for a client that you know if you can now get that case study or that testimonial that you can bring to the next one who pays do it right like I've done free work, we've done free marketing work. 
We've done it for somebody who we know we could get a great case study out of, that then we go to this other company and say, look what we did for this company. We got a testimonial. You can call them if you want to tell you how great of a job we did. And it paid off in the long run, right? Any other questions? What else? What's that? What's your um, name? <clears throat> I'm Evan. Uh, Evan. From like making a strategy standpoint or client acquisition or what have you, um, with market making a marketing agency in particular, was there any like hurdles that you had to jump over that you didn't expect that kind of surprised you about that space? Um, I don't know. Like, I guess I've learned like little things along the way, but like, I can I can just tell you some things that that like are daily, like one, technology changes every day, right? So two years ago, we weren't an Amazon marketing agency. Today, we are. Today, if you go on Amazon and you look at a product, we have a service where we do everything you see. Copy, images, we get the reviews that you're looking at to figure out whether to buy a product or not. Um, we sometimes do those emails that you get from the company a few weeks later saying how your experience was, will you give us a review, the videos on there. You know, these technology platforms change every day. Um, so I kind of saw that though. I, I would say I have a sort of an unfair advantage because I wasn't coming from an ad agency before. If I had worked for an ad agency before, or a web development company, or a video production company, I would have already had these preconceived notions of this is how it's supposed to be. And then I go off and start my own and I probably would have been smacked in the face a lot more. But because I just had to learn on the fly, like I would literally YouTube shit of how to do this and then turn around and do it for a client. You know, because I was in that position, um, things didn't really come as unexpected in terms of like the industry. Um, but some things that I did learn like you know marketing companies can't really market themselves so like when we first started I was like oh I'm gonna take everything we're doing and I'm gonna do it for our own company which means I'm gonna work on SEO I'm gonna make sure we do our own social media do all that I realized that that doesn't actually really get business like marketing to marketers is really hard right it's it's like you know they're they're in it all day long so it's less effective when they see an ad they're not looking at an ad being like shit that's an awesome product they're looking at an ad being like yeah those colors suck right like so so that was different i also learned that the way to get new business is to try to get awards in the marketing industry even though a lot of companies buy those awards like literally buy the award blows my mind but like it still works like agencies still go will pay five thousand dollars to be nominated for an award and then they'll pay a little bit more money and they'll be selected to some you know bronze or gold or silver or platinum or whatever and then you get a logo that then you can put on your website saying I won this award and that will actually get you new business so that I learned is pretty ridiculous, but it's how you know it's how it works. Um, not all of them. I mean, obviously, there's, there's awards you can win. Like that's just some of them, but that's a thing. That's a that's a legit thing. Um, so th that's that's unexpected. But one thing that just popped in my head. It doesn't really answer your question, but it like your network is your net worth. That freaking saying is incredibly true for whatever business you have. So. Uh, early on in the business, I got away from this when trying to think like, hey, we can market ourselves across the country by showing up first in Google and running Facebook ads and doing all of this different stuff and people are going to want to hire us. It didn't really work that way. But as soon as I made the realization that, man, if I go meet this person, I'm nice to him. Or I you know, meet the CEO of company XYZ and, and she loves me, then she's going to recommend me to her 10 business buddies and I'm going to get three of them as clients and I did zero marketing and advertising you know so it's that network effect is is true for any business you guys are thinking about starting that's a good place to start network and social proof what else what's up um, what's your name uh, Alan Alan uh, yeah nice to meet you 
question too as well. Um, how do you go about managing two two different companies um, on a daily basis? Oh, it's really hard. It's really hard. Um, so I own Jackson Jovi with my wife, who also has a full time job. Uh, I'll s let me start with Good Monster. So Good Monster is like my day job. Good Monster's full time. You know, I like to say that's my 100% focus, and then I find some extra percentage to put into Jackson Jovi. At this stage, uh, that's the way it needs to be, because ultimately, Good Monster is going it is sort of the engine for Jackson Jovi. Meaning, like, Good Monster, all the shit we learn at Good Monster, we deploy on Jackson Jovi for marketing, right? Um, it's also it's also a slow growth, like when we first started Jackson Jovi had these plans to like go all in and pump out you know hundreds of genes a, a month and work on production and produce 5,000 genes a year and you know do all this stuff and real quickly learned that's not necessarily a healthy way to build a long-term company and so I sat down with my wife and I was like you know what do we want like what do we want in 10 years 15 years like what do we want to do with Jackson Jovi do we want to try to go get $10 million in funding, beef it up, and then sell it? Do we want to have this thing forever and grow this like blue chip company that's known for quality and, and 15 years from now we're making the best jeans still made in America, uh, you know, and we've come out with other high quality clothes that you wear forever? Like, what do we want to be known as? And we just kind of figured out that if we go, grow slow, we're, it's not as stressful. Like, it's just not. If you take on $10 million in funding, well, now you have five to 10 people who are all staring at your financial sheets every day wondering, like, when you're going to turn a profit. Like, why didn't you hit these numbers? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? What? You know, great to have $10 million in your pocket, but it sucks to have those emails come in and taking punches to the gut every single morning 100 times more than you were before. Uh, so... You know, it's it's still tough because my wife and I still do most of the work for Jackson Joby. We converted our garage into the warehouse. We have 600 pairs of jeans in there right now, and probably five orders to go home to and, and fulfill. Now, you know, my mo we've split up the duties, so my wife does most of the customer service and fulfillment, and I do most of the marketing and the finances and business side. But it's it's still a juggling act. So. Managing the two businesses, you know, there was like some study where they figured out like you you can't truly multitask. So everyone that says like, yeah, I'm a good multitasker, you're actually not. Like some people might be better than others because you can switch quickly, but you literally can't do a hundred percent of two things at once. Like the the percentages don't match up. They don't you know those equations don't work. So my focus is in Good Monster, but I'm still doing Jackson Jovi. This is a long-term investment. Lindsay and I would love it to be, you know, a million-dollar company in five, six, seven years. There's not a huge rush on it. We'd rather it be quality before we hit the quantity. What else? Any other questions? Yeah. What's your name? Connor. Connor. Nice yes, to meet you. You talked about the, like, me and marketing and online marketing. So, what is it? Like what's the biggest piece of, what's the biggest thing that you learned about social media and online marketing through doing that? Or like how to be successful today? Um, social proof is king, queen, emperor, and every other leader. Meaning, that's why influencer marketing is so important. That's why testimonials are so important. So we are, so we have a large SEO business um, in terms of percentage search engine optimization. I would literally tell 99% of companies to not hire us for SEO if it means that they would hire another company to go do some sort of marketing that promotes their social proof, whether it's influencer marketing. Like we do influencer marketing also, but like if I was given the choice of like take their business as SEO or tell them to go do this other thing and build up their reviews, their ratings, their case studies, their their social proof, other people recommending them, I tell them to go do that because I know that's going to be so much more effective in a social media digitally driven world 
than showing up first in Google, right? Who are you guys gonna pick? The first ranking in Google where their website looks like shit, they get terrible ratings, and it looks like they do a shitty job on whatever you're looking for, or some influencer that says, oh my God, these shoes are the most comfortable fucking thing I've ever put on in my life. It's like walking on clouds, and they're only 40 bucks. I mean, right? Like, somebody recommending something is the way social media works these days. So that's where I would put 100% of my effort is into getting some sort of social proof on record on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or LinkedIn first. And then, you know, Snapchat or wherever else you want to go. But those four are going to be the most effective and most efficient depending on like LinkedIn is even becoming a thing where now it's not it's still business but it's becoming closer and closer to a Facebook or an Instagram or a YouTube than it ever has are you guys spending more time on LinkedIn right now or not really like obviously more on a professional level but you're seeing more content out there more videos more informational educational more news you know, they've done a great job over the past year of creating an environment that's much more engaging than just Sally got a new job yesterday, congratulate her, which is what it used to be. So, so those four networks, uh, we're actually getting tons of business from LinkedIn. I put out a show, and you not connected me on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn. You'll see, I put, we put out a show, it's called Grand Advice by Good Monster. We just started doing this, I don't know, like six months ago, or not even. And uh, there are videos where I just talk about a different topic every, every time. It might be why brand is more important than SEO. Uh, you know, the, re like the latest episode was like the secret behind Facebook ads. It's not Facebook the platform, it's the, con it's the creative. Like the only reason that you're gonna click on an ad or a piece of content is because you like the creative, not because it's just there, right? Like somebody can't just, a business isn't gonna spend $100,000 on Facebook ads and show you, you know, a blank screen. Like it's the creative that matters. So the more you make sure the creative, the video, the thing like that, the pictures connect with the person, the more that return on ad spend you're gonna get, right? Like, so Grand Advice is a video show where we talk about things like that. And I'm literally getting DMs of people being like, hey, I saw, I, we got a company out of Austin, Texas that makes like, like a, uh, you know, like swell water bottles or whatever that thing is you have in your backpack right there. Basically, that you put a wine bottle inside of it, screw it on, it'll keep it cold for like 20 hours. He just randomly, the CEO randomly saw a YouTube vi or a video that we put out, that I put out about Amazon marketing, DM'd me and was like, "Hey, we need to talk," and we'll we'll probably end up signing them hopefully within a week. So this content on LinkedIn, they've done a great job of putting out this, um, changing their algorithm to make sure this content gets out to the right people, and it's super valuable. So uh, if you're looking, if you're interested in social media, how to utilize social media, just watch what we're doing on, watch what I'm doing on LinkedIn, and uh, it'll paint a good picture. But if you're in a consumer, if you're trying to sell shoes or shirts or jeans or something like that, like that's Instagram. I mean, you could still do it on LinkedIn, and it, honestly, it might might get to the right person. But like, when you're talking consumer businesses, it's probably Instagram. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm not really going to write I know. I met you. Yeah. Um, when you first started, did you mostly like do everything yourself, or were you looking to kind of get like a group of like? three or four people together to kind of like help you with like the things that you lacked or like did you kind of like go for a long time on your own? Uh, no, so I had a co-founder uh, who's no longer with the company, but he did all the video work. I was more on the strategy side. So I, I didn't actually tell you the story of how we came about, but remember that YouTube show I told you about, Project Rock City? So we were doing that. And then we went to, has anybody been to Sharky's in Liverpool? Or heard of it? Mm -hmm. So it's pretty close by, they have like beach volleyball and stuff like that. Um, but we went there and did 
one episode of Project Rock City, the owner loved it, was kind of a forward-thinking guy, and was like, hey, can you guys come in and do this every week for our concert series? With like Thursday, ba bands come in every Thursday. And we're like, sure, yeah, let's do it. Um, and he's like, yeah, cool, I'll give you 400 bucks every week, you know, um, eight weeks long or 10 weeks long or whatever. And uh, that was like the second four, foray into to owning a business is we were kind of like forced into doing that. So um, we just basically did Project Rock City for Sharkies every week. So my co-founder was just the guy who was, we got together and started this show. We weren't making any money. So like he fit what I didn't do well in this project. It evolved into a business. And then we started hiring, we got into websites, I think we're next. And we just contracted out a web developer and who's actually still with us today. And then social media, and then we contracted out a copywriter. And like we brought freelancers in to like fill in the gaps. I don't know that I would have done any different, but maybe in other businesses or, or like with Jackson Jovi, I guess, like bringing in people right from the get go that did things that I knew I wasn't good at would have made it a lot easier. So I would probably suggest that over learning it yourself, but like also that wasn't really my personality. Like I like to learn stuff before I would hire a contractor so that I knew what they were doing in case they were doing a shitty job. Like that was just me, but well, you should probably bring in somebody that understands finance a little bit because if you're gonna get $500,000, you're gonna win a business competition for $20,000, you should have somebody that has an idea how to spend that money efficiently. What else? Yeah. Do you feel What's that, your name? I'm Zach. Zach. Do you feel that as like social media platforms get more saturated with you know, like there's so much sponsored content on there right now, it's harder and harder to get through to the customer and kind of get your ads noticed, especially as like all of us right now. Like when I see a sponsored ad on Instagram, like, I get like, out of my face. It. Yeah. Yeah, it's like if something pops up in a story, I just like tap through it immediately. Like, yep. do you feel like it's getting harder and harder to like put good content out there? Or, like, what do you think? Is uh, succeeding on Instagram. So in the, in the traditional direction that a, that a marketing person takes, yes, it's getting harder and harder to make an ad. Uh, we will actually be making that shift, and we sort of already are. Like, CeCe doesn't even know right now. But, like, behind the scenes, like, we are structuring ourselves to be much more of a storytelling agency for that exact reason because it happens so fast. Like, I wish I could show you guys on the screen, you totally recognize like a very particular type of ad that's coming out on Instagram if you're even slightly into entrepreneurship and you see the same thing on YouTube and you see the same thing on uh, LinkedIn is the new ads that are coming out is somebody holding their phone filming and then they'll put the stripe at the top and the stripe at the bottom with the words of what they're talking about on the top and the bottom, like it's a very particular, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Have you seen this? It's a very particular style of ad. And it's, it's like the used car salesman in your face, right? So like, it's getting very saturated when you're advertising. Now, if you tell a great story that your customers, your potential customer, your audience is going to connect with, that isn't immediately about getting them to click and buy, that will be very effective. Now the problem is to get a brand to agree to that because there's not an immediate ROI, right? But you see this, this is how brands have been built forever. Nike, like Nike has a very specific brand. Um, aside from small like hiccups over the years of, you know, whatever, like they had a child labor thing a while back, like. Aside from like these dings to the brand, it's a ginormous brand because they've told very good stories over the life of their career in, in business that have led them to become this massive brand. It's very hard to do that. You have to survive a lot and you have to stay consistent. But by telling stories, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty, because I think that's what you're asking about, running an actual ad on Instagram that says, here's a great new shoe, 
is getting very saturated. It's still working now. It will for the next 36, 48 months, right? If you see a cool pair of shoes, you're gonna, you know, and you're a sneakerhead, like you're gonna click on it and be like, what is this new shoe? Maybe I wanna buy it. Like, so that will still be there. But to really differentiate yourself, the brand, brands are going to start to have to tell an organic story that's interesting to you. Name one thing that like is a hobby, sports or like, I don't know, like whatever. Sailing. What is that? Sailing. Sailing. So a company could go two different directions. Number one, they could show you an ad of, a, I don't know, a sailboat that's X amount of dollars, but you get 10% off, right? Sailboat's a weird, like, I don't know, an accessory or something like that, right? Or a sailing trip. Or they could partner with an influencer who you probably follow if you're into sailing. So they go find somebody really influential in the sailing space. They go out and they film a day in the life of that person, right? Then they take that content and run that as an ad. Red Bull does this all the time. Like Red Bull is a great example of a company that has been storytelling before storytelling was a thing. And you now see how big they are. So that ad is going to do better, maybe not to click and have you click and buy, but over, the t over time, showing you that type of content is going to build their brand and align it with people you respect a lot better, and they're going to tell better stories. So I think those ads are going to be very effective for a long, long time for the companies that do it right on whatever freaking platforms there are. VR, you're wearing goggles in, in class, or I don't know, whatever. Like Wherever that, that the mediums are, those types of stories are going to be effective, and the ones that are buy my stuff are going to be less effective, especially in your generation and underneath, because you're so used to it. You, you guys put blinders on from most ads and anything that even says sponsored content, right? You autom they automatically lose 50 points when you see the word sponsored content. It might still work, it's good for branding, but it automatically knocks it down because it's not organic and original. You know what it is? when you follow somebody who you respect and they're sailing using that sailboat without even mentioning it, right? So that's where, the, that's where the digital media world is going for sure. But again, that's very hard for a brand to grasp because it doesn't, if I spend $10,000 on this video, I'm not gonna immediately make $30,000 off of it. They will, it's just not like right, like, it's not like right there. It's you know it's a it's an ongoing thing. What else? Yeah. Um, so when you were starting your jean company, you like so you formulate your idea. How do you then go about like prototyping, and getting a manufactured actually like, get a solid product to start testing? Google. Went out to Google. I googled jeans manufacturer. A website came up. This uh, was called MakersRow.com. I logged on to makersrow.com. They wanted $19 for a membership in order to look at the factories on there. I paid $19, I got in there, I filled out, here's what we want to do. And you can select view factories that do this or have them contact you. I'm like, man, there's a lot of Chinese companies on here. Nothing against, like, but you know, if I clicked that button, like I would have been inundated by like a thousand companies, right? So I was like, okay. Let me look through the companies first, and then I'm gonna pick and choose the ones that look quality. And like our, our, our denim company is based on American made. Like that was our brand from the very get go. We're deep rooted in the CrossFit community. It's a lot of military and firefighters and, and police officers in there, men and women. So we knew automatically we were looking for an American made company. So I checked all those boxes, hit, uh, um, uh, send and it sent it to them and then we started getting bids and then it was just trial and error I mean our first round of jeans you know in hindsight this is an area Ellie where we should have partnered with a production specialist because we didn't know how production works with jeans it's sort of like wine if the grape if the weather's weird one year wine is going to taste one way if, if, if like 
the cotton crop was weird one year, like the denim is gonna stretch 5% more than it did the past year. So like that's why you guys go and shop at a, uh, you have the brand of jeans you love, and then you go to buy another pair of jeans and it, it doesn't fit quite the same. Like that's why it's like denim is this weird, super strong, super durable, uh, super comfortable fabric, but it, it's hard to get it exactly the same every single time. We didn't know that. So we ordered our first run. They were perfect. They were great. Um, we, we did a, a cell phone pocket. That was like one of the new things. So like we got that right. Then we did a reorder and we didn't have what's called a tech pack, which is basically the blueprints for your jeans. So we just relied on our manufacturer to recreate the same thing again. Well, this time, this cell phone pocket ended up on the side of the knee, which is super uncomfortable. And they were three inches too long. The legs were all like 34 inches long. And it's because we didn't have somebody in, the, in production that was like, oh, you guys need a tech pack or else this thing's gonna go like the Wild West. Yeah, so we had to deal with all of that. But after Google, YouTube, uh, here's an entrepreneur story for you. I actually learned how to hem jeans and even taper jeans so that uh, you, actually you asked the question earlier, this is a good tie-in, about what we were willing to do or not do for customers. So we started to get people who were asking for weird, like 27 inch inseams and like just you know not the normal stuff that we had. So I was like, screw it, I'll just learn how to hem and give it to them for free. Started doing that and like, sales went through the route. We started doing that, these at the events. I'd literally bring a sewing machine and sit down in the front, like hem jeans, and people were like, what are you doing? And I'm like, hemming jeans. You guys are doing this right here? What? They're like, okay, I'll buy a pair, measure me. Like, you know, we're just doing custom made jeans. Like, it's a whole thing that we didn't plan on doing. I was just like, they want this, it's valuable. It costs you 10 to $30 to go to a tailor and get something tailored. Like, I'll do it right here for free. Oh, and you're buying some badass, high quality jeans. So like, just learn, you know, just do it. What else? Any other questions about you? Yeah, what's your name? John. John, me too. Uh, so I was just wondering like, what, was there something like a specific event or like a mindset that you had that like drove you to starting like a business in the first place and like kind of like jumping off from like your, like going into a career that was maybe governed by your major or something? Um, so I sort of, I blame my parents. Yeah. Like I think they just empowered that risk uh, aversion that I have to to not being happy in the marketing director role and just saying like screw it like I got I need to go do this thing I don't know what it's gonna come out like or I don't know where it's gonna lead but I like I just need to do this thing because I'm not happy right now so you know each of you have your own like different upbringings and and situations so like everyone's mindset is going to be different um, and your like, circumstances are going to be different of whether like like all the other dominoes that are going to fall when you make the decision in your head to do that and so it's going to be harder for some of you to say like yeah like I have this dream that I want to go do and then all the things happen in your head like oh like you know like I was taught to do this or like I can't like not have $20,000 saved in the bank when I go do this thing or or I'm supposed to go do this or I'm supposed to get a job as an accountant or you know like everyone's in this different thing but in terms of a mindset uh, my mindset was like I want to be happy in life and I'm happiest when I'm creating things so like it, obviously there's other things thoughts that went through my head but like when you boil it down like that's the mindset I had and then mindset number two or thought number two is like am I willing to deal with all the other shit that's going to come from this decision because it's nobody else's fault it's mine so I have to be okay with moving back in with my parents and telling all my friends like yeah I live with my mom and dad I'm t uh, I don't even remember how old I was I actually moved back in with them twice I graduated college moved to Boston, then moved to Richmond, 
um, probably was like 26, maybe moved back home in to back to Syracuse with my parents, lived with them, then got the marketing director job, then moved out, then decided to start the agency, then moved back with, in with them. So I don't know, it's probably like 28, right? Like, I'm like, I'm okay with it. Like, I got friends that are making 100 grand a year as sales reps and, you know, buying cars. And I was like, I don't, just don't give a shit about that. I'd rather be 40 years old have a multi-million dollar company like I don't really need stuff I just want to be comfortable and I want to do this thing and like I'm okay with eating some shit leading up to that so like that was my mindset not saying that that should be any of your mindsets like that's you know that's just my personal so you got to weigh all the other stuff you know student loans like I still have student loans sucks but like that's something I was willing to deal with of paying off a loan for a thing that I don't even do anymore. But there's upsides to it also. I'm still very involved in fitness. Uh, I love CrossFit. It's competitive. It's cool. I love it. So I don't know if I ever would have gotten into that if I didn't get a degree in kinesiology and like go down that route. Yeah. What else? Who else? Yeah, what's your name? Alex. Alex, what's up, man? So um, you kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we learned in, our, like, in my entrepreneurship class that like a lot of entrepreneurs, like most of them, like fail at some point in like their businesses. And I was just wondering if there's like any instances where an idea or a strategy just completely like blew up in your face and failed. And if so, like how did you deal with it and how did you like learn from it? Um, in my head when we started, I felt like I had a very clear like way we were going to grow and how we were going to grow and like the strategy that we were going to use and the services that we were going to offer. And, uh, you know, my first business partner just wanted to b stay at home with his family and be a freelancer. So, like, as I'm, like, hard charging up this one route, relying on him to do all the video work and things like that, uh, I never even asked him or realized, like, he didn't want that thing. So, uh, got to the point where, you know, some of the work was suffer suffering because, like, he wasn't doing the business side of it because he wasn't passionate about that and we sat down and I was like dude like we have all these opportunities like here we go we're going crazy he's like I don't really want that so we just figured out he wasn't good like to be a business owner and he broke off and became a freelancer and actually we ended up hiring him to do video jobs like back anyways we had a good relationship but like that failed then I took on another business partner because I thought I needed a fit for the things that I wasn't good at so hired him on as an employee first, and I was like, cool, if we make it past one year, you'll start earning uh, like partnership in the company for a lower salary, and that'll be sort of an, a time investment into the company. Well, did that for a, a year and a half to two years, and he got to the end of that, realized he didn't like the punches to the gut, and wanted to start a family and just wasn't in that do at whatever it takes risk adverse kind of environment so I had to buy him out of the company and like you know so like that didn't work out um, so those are two big ones that it was sort of like eh, and then like right away and then back up and then you know right away so like you just you just have to deal with it you know so both of them were good relationships and and um, mutual kind of splits but it was tough because now you're just losing this huge section of the company and now you gotta find a, rep like I define, how do we maintain all this video work? Like literally our videographer is going away. So like we hired him back for some jobs and I hired a new videographer. And for the second one, he handled a lot of our search engine optimization and things like that. So now I had to go find somebody to handle all that strategy because it's not what I do. Um, so that's one, one, two large examples. One other example is, this is a good lesson for you guys. We had a very large international company that makes um, baby food makers, basically. Like, blend it, steam it, all in one. So uh, they hired us on to help grow their e-commerce business across everything. Email marketing, social media advertising. We redid their website, Amazon uh, marketing and, and management. Um, 
influencer marketing. So they were in every Target store. Actually, they did that halfway through us. We helped them with their Target launch, right? So we beat Target sales goals by 147% in the first month. We grew their e-commerce from $8,000 a month to $35,000 a month in three months. Um, we took their Amazon from, I don't even know the numbers, a lot to a lot more, or, or a, a decent amount to a lot more. And they still weren't happy. And they weren't happy because the CEO of the USA division had the international CEO saying, you guys are the US of A, like you're the biggest consumer country in the world. You know, you're making X millions of dollars. You should really be making this many. Like, I'm pretty sure he would have said that anyways. It doesn't matter what we hit, it was always gonna be you should be here. So the, the relationship sucked. Like, no matter how good of a job we did, we actually use this as a case study now because it's such a good case study of how good of a job we did. But we ended up losing that client because of that. Some other factors also, but it was uncontrollable. Something we literally could not have controlled. We did it lower cost, cheaper than any other agency because they were headquarters were in New York City, and New York City agencies charge at least three times what we do because we're here in Syracuse. So we were cheaper, and we did a better job than probably most other agencies out there in the time span that we did it in, and it still wasn't good enough. So a huge win on our end, but a failure in terms of the client relationship, you know? So those are the punches to the gut. You gotta be like, this was a huge win, good job. Like, it was tough. I had somebody on my team almost quit because they couldn't deal with that one client. Even though they loved me, they loved coworkers, they loved us as an agency, they just couldn't deal with it anymore. Luckily, we split with that client in time and all of a sudden they were happy again. You know, like, so it's, it's tough. Yeah. Anybody else? We got time. Good? Nice. Thanks everyone for having me in. Hopefully it was helpful.